Hello folks, it's Mr Neil here and in this video I'm going to be reviewing the website design and development unit from Higher Compute Science. In this unit you'd expect to analyse and design solutions to website problems before implementing those solutions using HTML, CSS and JavaScript. Once we have implemented our solutions we then need to test and evaluate them ensuring that they're usable and fit for purpose. You can find the full unit specification for website design and development within the Higher Computing Science course specification which is available on the SQA website. From National 5 Computing Science you'll recall that we need to identify the end user requirements and functional requirements of a website. The end user requirements identify what the user wants to do on your website. So for example if we look at Twitter, as a user of Twitter I want to be able to see the tweets of people that I follow. The functional requirements are what the developer must do to ensure that the website meets the end user requirements. For example, with Twitter, the developers will ensure there's a logging feature and then the ability to find the tweets of the people that I follow before displaying them in chronological order. Once we've analysed the problem, we can then design our solution. The design of the structure for a website is vital to ensure that the users can easily find information on what could be thousands of individual pages. Hierarchical structures using navigational bars allow navigation throughout a multi-level website to be logical and straightforward. We have an example on screen for Roslyn Academy. You can see that we have a home page that we land on and then three sub pages. These three sub pages will form part of our main navigation bar within the website. And within the subject section of the website, we then have three pages on the next level down. Once we've designed the structure of the website, we can then move on to designing the structure of individual pages. A wireframe provides a clear example of what a web page should look like and shows where different media is to be displayed. The wireframe should show the intended layout of the page and the position of navigational bars and links, all text, media, interactive elements, any form inputs, and hyperlinks. Sometimes the wireframe may also include annotations that specify how the content should be styled using CSS, for example the background colour, font or size. Once wireframes have been produced, low fidelity prototypes can be produced and these are produced fairly quickly traditionally using pen and paper. They're shown to the end user group as part of usability testing which we'll touch on later. And the feedback from that end user group should then be considered when the final version of the site has been developed. When we're designing our web pages, we need to ensure that they're well designed. This means that we take into consideration the visual layout of the page, ensuring that the page is not too cluttered. We make sure that the website is readable, meaning that it is presented in a way that is accessible to our target users. And throughout the website, there is a consistent design. Once we've designed our web page, we can then move on to implementing it using HTML. A web page can be split up into different sections. All of these sections are within the body of the page. The header element will show the website banner. This will often include a title and an image. The nav element will contain the navigational links within our website. The main element will contain the page content, the text, the images, the audio, the videos. And the footer element will contain information about the web page or website. For example, contact details, links to social media or legal information. Much of the HTML that we will implement at Higher is similar to that of National 5. However, at Higher we're expected to be able to implement forms. The form element allows user input to be collected in a form. At Higher, the elements that we will use are text, number, text area, radio and submit. On the screen here you can see an example of a simple form. Let's have a wee look at how that form would be implemented. Firstly, we start with a text field. We then move on to a number field. We then move on to a bullet pointed list. We then move on to radio buttons, where each radio button will have this code. Then we have a drop down menu. The drop down menu is included within the select tag and all the options within option tags. Next, we have a text area where the rows and the columns are the size of the text area. And lastly, every form needs a button that when the user clicks on, an action is implemented. When we are creating our forms, we can add in form validation. Form validation, like validation with databases, tries to ensure that the data is more accurate. We can add maximum and minimum values. So max, min and max length can be added to text input, numerical input and text areas to limit the number of characters that can be entered or to set a range of valid numerical values. Looking at the text box here on screen, we have a max length set to 25. 
looking at the number field here, the minimum number that can be entered is zero and the maximum number that can be entered is 100. We can also implement a presence check. When asking a user to complete a form, it is sometimes necessary to ensure that one or more inputs are not left blank by the user. Thinking about when you sign up to social media accounts, you have to enter your name and email address. To do this, we add the tag that is required. Now moving on to cascading style sheets. At higher, you'll use a combination of all three style sheets, inline, internal and external. When we run the web page, all the style sheets will cascade into a virtual style sheet, with inline styles getting priority, then internal and lastly external. At higher, the majority of the CSS that you will implement will control or modify the appearance and positioning of elements on a page. Let's firstly have a look at the display property. The display property can have one of three values, block, and this ensures that the element uses the entire width of its container, the container being the tag that it is inside of. For example, a div tag inside the main section. In line means that the element will use only as much width as necessary. For example, an image that is only 300 pixels wide will use only 300 pixels, meaning that the next element can appear right next to it. The none property will mean that the element will not be visible. Using the float property, an element can be set to the left or the right of its container. Floating elements can continue down a page until we use a property called clear. For example, if we have a header and our main and we do not want them to interfere with each other, we can add the clear property to them. Margins and padding are used to move and push content from the edge of elements, much like the box model shown here. The blue dotted line here represents the edge of an element. The margin is a transparent area around the outside of an element, and the padding is a transparent area around the inside of an element. Margins and padding can be added to a whole element or one specific side. For example, margins is 20, or the margin left is 20. A nav bar is created using UL and LI tags inside the nav section. CSS can be used to change the appearance. This is an example of where we use descendant selectors. For example, this rule here will only modify the unordered list within the nav section. This rule here will only modify the LI item within the UL within the nav section. It is worth making sure that you know how this code works and how you can edit it. When two or more selectors have the same rules, these can be grouped together. To group these together, we can use a comma to separate the selectors. So in this case, the paragraph, the unordered list and the ordered list will all be dark blue. With descendant selectors, as previously highlighted, there may be times where we don't want all elements such as paragraphs in a page to use the same styles. So in this example here, the heading two within the section two will be styled in yellow, but other heading twos will be untouched. Moving on now to JavaScript. JavaScript is the main client-side scripting language. It can be used to create, delete, and manipulate HTML elements. JavaScript can be contained in the HTML document or in its own file and linked to a web page in the same way that CSS can be linked. At higher, JavaScript functions are created that will change what appears on screen depending upon what the user does with the mouse. So for this example here, the user clicks on a button and the image is then changed. There are a number of different mouse events that can be used to trigger the execution of JavaScript events. The ones that we will focus on are, the ones that we will look at are on mouse over, where the user moves the mouse over an element and JavaScript is executed. On mouse out, where the user moves the mouse out of an element and JavaScript is executed and on click, where the user clicks on an element and JavaScript is then executed. Let's have a very quick look at an example JavaScript function. In this example, when the user clicks on this heading one, the content is changed within the function to look I've changed. This is a very simple example. You should make sure that you understand how more complex examples work. Once we have implemented our website using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, we can then start to test it. There are three different ways that we can test our website. Firstly, usability testing. The aim of usability testing is to create real world conditions where a website might be used. Usability testing can show problems within a design at the early stage. Therefore, usability testing is utilized with low fidelity prototype. The low fidelity prototypes are used under observation and the developer then makes notes of any issues or problems and a result of this testing changes to the design can be made if necessary. 
When undertaking usability testing, the test group will develop personas. These will relate to the experience or the age of the testers. Test case will include a set of steps that seek to test a specific feature of the website. For example, how does the user log into your website? And then a test scenario would be the task that the tester would be given to carry out. We then move on to functional testing. And these are the tests to ensure that your website functions and meets the functional requirements. This means you're testing the input validation of your forms, you're testing the links and navigation, and lastly, ensuring that all media, text, images, audio, and videos are correct. A website should be tested on as many devices as possible. This means testing the website on different browsers, for example, Chrome, Microsoft Edge, and Safari, and a range of different devices, laptop, tablet, smartphone. Compatibility testing can expose the following problems. Depending on the browser or the device, there may be changes in the font size, alignment issues, scrolling issues, or elements overlapping each other. Once your website has been fully tested, you can then move on to evaluation. Within the evaluation, we're assessing if the website is fit for purpose. A website is deemed to be fit for purpose if it meets the end user and functional requirements determined at the analysis phase. In this video, I have reviewed the Higher Computing Science Website Design and Development Unit, looking at analysis, design, implementation of HTML, CSS and JavaScript, and then testing and evaluation. If there are any aspects of this unit that you're not sure of, I recommend that you undertake further study using the resources available to you to support this. These resources may come from your own classroom teacher, or it may be those that are available on the SQA, BBC Bite Size and Scholar websites.